Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. I'm Dr. Daniel Gonzalez. I'm a chiropractor practicing functional medicine and health consulting in Austin, Texas for over 20 years now. Now, I consult with healthcare providers and patients all across the United States, and I've had the pleasure of working with people in even other parts of the world. But today, I'm excited to be here with you to be able to share some information that is really near and dear to my heart, and that's children's health. Specifically, we're going to be talking about ADD and the gut-brain connection in a pediatric population. Now, as a father myself, I take children's health and development seriously. We all know that children are the future, and it's concerning to think that they're developing chronic health issues at such an early age, which is ultimately going to influence how they behave and navigate the world as adults. And I think it's important to help parents understand that, you know, their child is not acting a certain way to irritate mom or dad or even teachers, because when we understand the neurobiology of ADD and human health, and then when we work towards resolving those health issues, especially with the functional medicine approach, diving into the metabolic and nutritional and environmental or genetic vulnerabilities, we have power in our decisions. And in many cases, we're completely capable of eliminating the symptoms or at least improving upon those symptoms. With that said, let's go ahead and get started. Now, I titled this presentation Brain on Fire because it's an accurate description of what is actually happening with most brain-based disorders. And this includes things like mood disorders such as depression, anxiety, panic, and then of course, neurobehavioral dysfunctions such as ADD, autism, or anything that's on the spectrum. Now, ADD is a neurodevelopmental disorder that affects millions of children worldwide. It is characterized by symptoms of inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity, and it can have a significant impact on a child's academic, social, and emotional well-being. While the exact causes of ADD are still unknown, in other words, there's no biological uh, uh, activity that we can measure right, to diagnose ADD, recent research has suggested that the gut microbiome plays a crucial role in the development and severity of ADD and symptoms via influence of immunological pathways, metabolic pathways, and neuroendocrine pathways. Now, today, there are millions of children who have been diagnosed with a chronic health condition, and the numbers just keep getting worse. I mean, take, for example, these statistics. At least one in eight children now have asthma. One in five children experience eczema. Three out of five children suffer from environmental allergies. One in 12 children will have a true food allergy, and one in three will have food intolerances. One in five are now considered obese or overweight, and there's a 5% increase in type 2 diabetes every year in the United States in our children. One in six children now have autism, and that is scary because that's up from one in 500 from just 1999. Now, according to the CDC, approximately 10% of children in the U.S. have been diagnosed with ADD, and the prevalence of ADD actually varies by age, gender, and other factors, but has steadily been increasing year after year. And this really suggests that it's environmental and lifestyle root-driven as opposed to, let's just say, genetics or just bad luck. Now, given the fact that 90% of these kids are placed on a stimulant as a primary treatment, it's my opinion that that's really just being lazy and not delivering the care that our children ultimately deserve. Now, it's obvious that children need help and they absolutely deserve better than simply medicating them into an appropriate behavior. And that's why I fell in love with functional medicine because like chiropractic, it's, about, it's not just seeking a Band-Aid solution, right? We're not just trying to cover up symptoms here but it's actually aimed at identifying actual physiological dysfunctions within the body and then working towards correcting them. Now, for those of you that don't know this, medication works. Prescription drugs absolutely do what they're supposed to do. The problem is that they also do things that we're unaware of. And more often than not, it's a type of collateral damage that actually starts to cause other issues. Of course, a functional approach is one that tries to determine if there's a physiological deficiency or an imbalance that can be corrected. And again, when these imbalances are identified and corrected, symptoms disappear as the underlying cause is treated. Another important concept is the understanding that our body does nothing wrong to harm us. Our body comes prepackaged with an innate intelligence so powerful, so fierce, and so full of wisdom 
that it really no, needs no help in healing. It simply needs no interference. And I believe that it's our job to identify those interferences and then remove them. So when it comes to something like ADD and trying to find out what's wrong, we should also have the mental fortitude to see what's right about it. And I mean, ADD in school is disruptive, right? But when you think about it, adults with ADD are actually the ones who are changing the world. These are the employees that you actually wanna have. They're the CEOs, they're the entrepreneurs, and the developers literally of new ideas, literally the world's future creators. Because it's this type of energy, it's the passion, the creativity, that kind of brain that can actually make changes to the world. So rather than suppressing that energy, I think we should actually be trying to find ways to productively express it. Now, neurodevelopmental disorders are neurologically based conditions that interfere with the acquisition, retention, or application of specific skills or sets of information. They may involve dysfunction in attention, memory, perception, language, problem solving, or social interaction. So when it comes to something like ADD, ADHD, or any other development issue, we should really try to get very specific and granular on the specific dysfunctions within that particular diagnosis. Like any chronic health condition, the diagnosis is just that. It's just a diagnosis. It's a label. It's not where you stop. It's, it doesn't tell you specifically the mechanisms that are dysfunctional. And there are many pathways actually, or many roads that can lead to the same diagnosis. So the goal is to always work towards identifying the specific pathways that are leading to a particular issue. For example, we can see here autism, ADD, dyslexia, and sensory processing. And then you have different types of dysfunctions that can you know, be mapped underneath that. Uh, this includes things like learning problems, sensory problems, motor communication and psychological issues. Again, we want to map out specific problems that connect with possible physiological mechanisms. For example, when somebody with autism, you know, they, they can have learning problems, communication and psychological issues, but someone with autism could also just have sensory and motor problems. Um, for example, ADD, where you can have an individual who struggles with learning psychological and motor issues, or you can have ADD and you know, have somebody who just has sensory and communication problems. Again, what we wanna do is try to be very specific in the problems that the individual has, not just simply focus on the label that they've been given. In addition, the diagnosis of ADD and ADHD are now considered subtypes of the same diagnosis according to DSM-5. So you can have ADD, which is just inattention, or you can have ADHD with inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. The diagnosis is going to be based off of sub subjective symptoms, largely based off subjective symptoms. Uh, there's questionnaires and validated intake form, uh, 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 clinical evaluation forms. There's no biological basis, right? And so uh, symptoms of inattention, hyperactivity, along with additional criteria such as those listed here, you could have you know, the impacts on quality of life. Uh, are there any other med medical conditions that have been identified? Did the symptoms present before age 12, et cetera? Now, when you start to review research that has identified risk factors for ADD, ADHD, there's actually quite a few studies now. Now this graph here comes from a great study that was published, a meta-analysis actually of all the environmental risk factors for uh, ADD, ADHD. And you can see this force plot diagram here where anything on the, the line right drawn right down the middle uh, has no effect, but anything on the right side of the line has a significant impact. And so you know, from this data, we can see that the number one impact causing brains to not develop is a child eating disorder. And we say child eating disorder, but let me be very clear here what the research describes as that. It's basically a high sugar, high fat diet. So high sugar, high fat with some of the susceptible genes leads to the expression of ADD. So diet is huge, right? And then you have other things that you can read here off this list. You have things like preterm birth weight, head trauma, 
gestational diabetes, maternal SSRIs, and that is actually huge, the exposure of antidepressants when mom was pregnant. Uh, it's actually really, really big. It's a big problem. Maternal hypothyroidism, and there's such a thing as subclinical hypothyroidism, where maybe their thyroid markers show up normal, but they actually have hypothyroidism. That is, again, another big problem because it's often misdiagnosed. You have a lot of micronutrient deficiencies of mom before she got pregnant and even during pregnancy. Low vitamin D, low omega, low minerals, low vitamins. Again, most people are micronutrient deficient and they have no clue of their status. Now, when you look at the conventional research of what's been published, again, it's very clear that diet, eating disorders, and nutritional deficiencies are all part of the equation. But as you can see here from this force plot diagram, again, all the things towards the right, there's a lot of environmental toxicity, heavy metals, organopesticides, phthalates. And, and the problem with all this is that all these environmental factors, they really get ignored. And kiddos are simply given addictive stimulants with no lifestyle, no dietary intervention whatsoever. Or maybe the doctor just says, clean up your diet, and that's pretty much it. Now to summarize, you can see in utero and postnatal factors that are listed here. My goal with this slide is that we can share risk factors with any parent who's thinking about having children, or I think more importantly, those who already have a child that have been given a diagnosis of ADD, because hey, obviously there's a risk there and we should be doing everything we can if she's gonna have another child to reduce those risk factors and try to correct these things to prevent you know, that future birth from, uh, or child from developing ADD as well. But obviously for anybody that's planning a child and they're wanting to optimize their health, these are all things that we should really look at and these are things that we should be doing uh, in trying to help prevent future occurrence should they want to have more children. In this study, scientists looked at structural imaging of the brain over time, where you can see brain development between 20 weeks all the way up to 20 years. Now, first, if you look at, the, there's blue bars, right, that I created here, these blue lines, and you can see the first bar there before that, that's the gestation period. So basically before the first year of life or before birth. And if you look at the cortical gray matter and the cortical white matter, we can see that the gray matter, which is red, and the white matter, which is pink, you can see that it just dramatically rises up, right? Right before birth. So that's a critical window of development. And then the first two years of life, you can see again, a huge bump in critical gray matter and white matter, you know, a little bit less, but it's still going up. So that's another critical, obviously, uh, time of our life and development. And then it plateaus between two years to 10 years. And once you get into your 20s, well, that's pretty much it, right? White matter still has some chance right around 20, but the key thing to understand is that we have these short windows of opportunity to truly influence the brains for future health. Now, this initial two-year period of life is really, really critical. And brain development, for the most part, again, ends in our 20s. Sure, there's some plasticity, but the majority of influence is going to happen before that. So up until birth, the fetal development and gestation period are really critical windows of time. And this is all depending on identifying as many maternal risk factors, uh, again, nutritional status, uh, an environmental chemical uh, load or toxic load. Uh, is she smoking? Does she have you know, a good diet? What's her microbiome like? All these things right, are factors that you can look at in terms of reducing those risk factors and then working towards optimizing the mother's health as much as possible. From birth to two years, we have another window where you know, the, where, where, where basically things like maternal nutrition, breastfeeding, and getting maximal nutrients into the baby are super important, helping their microbiome to develop. Then from two years to 10 years, that's where gray matter is developing. And it's basically done by 10. And this is the period where I would say that we want high physical activity. We really want to develop their, their personal fitness. It's, and then, of course, a continuation of nutrition and gut health. And then white matter all the way up to age 20. Now, the brain is still developing, right? The brain is still going through its wiring and connectivity. So the question becomes, what kind of input is the brain getting after the child is born? Well, if the inputs are eating macaroni and cheese and pizza all day, 
that's not going to be very good for brain development. And if they're getting no movement, no activity, no cognitive stimulation, if they're watching TV all day, they, they're going to have a different brain because of it. And that brain's basically going to be set by the age of 20. And I guarantee you that brain is not going to serve them properly as an adult. Now, the research is very clear on this. The brain of a child who eats healthy, has great micronutrient status, you know, healthy levels of omega-3s or essential fatty acids, healthy levels of minerals and vitamins, B vitamins, uh, who are breastfed, stimulated it properly, you know, cognitively, physically, they're going to have different brains and that's going to serve them for the rest of their life in a positive way. So the brain is basically developing throughout this time and it's critical that we do everything that we can possible to maximize this opportunity. Now, when you look at the microbiome and the weeks in development, just as we can look at the brain in developing, you know, they've, they've determined the structural changes of the brain. Well, the same is true with the microbiome. We know that it's actually becoming stable and developing over time. Now, there's this back and forth relationship as well, especially after the first two years, that these two systems support each other and are actively communicating back and forth. This is the time when we actually get wired either for health or for disease. And if you look at this slide here, you can see at the bottom the stages of, of brain development. And of course, we already went through that. And just know that, this, that very similarly, there's stages of the microbiome development that you can see up top. And this again begins uh, from mother, you know, her microbiome transferring into the baby in utero and then the first, you know, two years of life and on. And all the evidence suggests again that the microbiota plays a major role in shaping cognitive networks, encompassing emotional and social domains and neurodevelopmental disorders. Basically, as the brain is developing, so is the microbiome in tandem, and so are the intimate connections. Literally highways between the gut and the brain are being paved. And when you understand the influence of the gut, immunologically, neurologically, nutritionally, then you can begin to appreciate the importance of these connections. Now, there are dozens of studies linking the role of the microbiome to brain function and mood disorders or behavioral disorders, including ADD. And these microbiome pathways are involved with healthy gut function, and they're highly dependent on specific populations of bacterial species. Now, these organisms that live within our digestive system have a strong influence on systemic communication and activation in the brain, because these organisms are themselves responsible for producing neuropeptides and neurohormones, immune signaling compounds like cytokines, which can contribute to inflammation or help to regulate inflammation. And remember, when there's a lot of inflammation generated from the gut, there are very specific compounds that can transfer all the way up into the brain to create neural inflammation. Again, brain on fire, contributing to neurodevelopmental issues or mood disturbance and so much more. And all these pathways linking the gut to the brain begin with maternal gut health. So, you know, how healthy is mama before conception? And then you have the environment that her baby is growing up in, right? So it is absolutely crucial that we consider prevention strategies before mom gets pregnant, during her pregnancy, and then of course the first two years after her child is born. And again, you can see here listed out all of these factors, maternal diet and obesity, maternal infections and stress, gestational age, delivery mode, early life infections and stress in the baby and whether or not they're given antibiotics, which could devastate the microbiome, you know, for the child. Milk feeding patterns, complementary feeding and diet and nutritional supplementation. These are all things that, again, could either lead to optimal brain function or something like ADD. Now, one of the first places to start is nutrition. Food, as they say, is medicine. But food can also be our poison. So it just depends on what type of medicine you're taking. And here, based on this study, you can see that there's, you know, a Western diet. Let's just call it actually an ADD promoting diet, because that's basically what the science says. If you want ADD, in other words, then consume a diet with lots of sugar, lots of processed fast foods, refined carbohydrates, all the synthetic dyes, 
pesticides, you know, and all this leads to changes in your gut bacteria, and these gut bacteria then impact the development of the brain. And these metabolic pathways, these neurological pathways to the vagus nerve and immune pathways activating cytokines, these are all part of the reason dysbiosis or imbalances in good bacteria and bad bacteria in our diets have a significant impact on ADD. But it's deeper than that. It's not just the diet that impacts the brain. It's the diet impacting the microbiome and then the microbiome in turn influencing how our brain functions. Now, all of the research, like I've said, between gut and brain function has basically solidified three distinct pathways, a neurological pathway, a neuroendocrine pathway, and then an immune pathway. And these three pathways where the microbiome influences neurotransmitter production, neuropeptides, metabolites like short chain fatty acids, hormones, do dopamine, serotonin, GABA, histamine, immune signaling compounds, they all in turn influence the brain. And they're all part of how this works together. So the point here is that you really do have to take a step back and you have to look at treating the entire system, right? We can't just treat with neurotransmitters or stimulants and call it a day. It just doesn't make sense when you understand how this all works. And these pathways are actually now being mapped out to specific populations of bacteria. In other words, you can take somebody who doesn't have ADD, you can take groups of people that don't have ADD, and you can identify specific species and levels of organisms in their digestive tract, and then you can take groups of people that have ADD, and you can see that it is completely different, right? So you can actually map this stuff out. And we know that there's probiotics, there's good bacteria, keystone species, Bifidobacterium, Bacteroides, Facobacterium. These are all organisms which can be connected back to certain types of brain function or brain dysfunctions. So the take home message with all this is that diet, lifestyle, pathogens, hormones, chemicals, they can all influence the trillions of organisms that make up our microbiome. And these organisms in turn express genes that influence our health. And let's pause on this for a minute because this is just huge. It's so important for you to understand this. You cannot change your human genetics, right? We all know that. You can't change it. Yes, there's epigenetics and it allows for expression based on your lifestyle and all that, but you can't change your human blueprint. It is what it is. But your microbiome, your microbial blueprint, you can actually change. And that means the expression of our microbiome genetics, which influences our health, can also change. These organisms produce metabolites, such as, again, neuropeptides, short-chain fatty acids. They produce vitamins. They help us to digest and absorb nutrients. They uh, produce hormones, uh, the immune response. 80% of our immune system lives within the gut. All of this, in turn, influences our brain. Now, when you look at the conventional treatment for ADD, ADHD, they basically look to see, you know, does this individual have any other conditions like psychosis or depression or tics or anxiety or heart disease? And if they do, then they won't, or at least they shouldn't, use a stimulant to treat. But according to the CDC, 90% of children diagnosed with ADD will actually be placed on a stimulant. So it doesn't seem like that's actually working out in terms of a decision tree. But here's a list of common stimulants that are utilized in the management of ADD. And I know most of you all know this, we're all familiar, Adderall, Concerta, Ritalin, Vyvanse. I mean, you've got a whole you know, list of them, right, that you can use. And we've talked about windows of development and how crucial they are in terms of optimizing brain function. In my opinion, knowing how these compounds influence the brain, we should have humility in prescribing them because a child who is placed on them has actually not fully developed, right? We're stimulating their brain while it's actually still changing. So what long-term impact do these drugs have on a developing brain? What impact do these medications have on the microbiome, which in turn influences brain function? We, we do know that these drugs short-term lead to various symptoms such as sleeplessness, headaches, a loss of appetite, which could also cause gut problems and dysbiosis. You have anxiety, 
depression, emotional ability. I mean, you've got all these things, right? Then you have long-term risks, which include things like heart disease, high blood pressure, seizures, irregular heart rate. But the most serious one is gonna be abuse and addiction. And that's actually the biggest concern that I have because that's what I see in my practice. So many adults that are literally addicted, they've been on these compounds since they're kids and they're trying to get off. They feel that it's wrecked their lives and they can't. And it's really the saddest thing that I've seen. To date, the literature is mixed on structural brain changes. Uh, some studies show positive changes, some studies show negative changes. So I think we just don't know enough about how all this really works. And to be honest, there's just too many factors that are at play to be able to really hone in on, you know, how this is exactly working and who can benefit from them. Now, when you look at all the factors involved with healthy brain development or opposite what is known to contribute to ADD, we see things like their dopaminergic activity has to go up. Their epinephrine, norepinephrine activity has to go up because these receptor sites are not responding well. Uh, the frontal lobe has to develop, especially in motor and executive functions. The frontal striatal connectivity has to take place. The microbiome has to be healthy. Nutritional status, right? Their nutritional health has to improve. We need to reduce food reactivity and sensitivities and allergies, and we have to avoid high glycemic index foods. These are all the clinical requirements for proper brain health. Now, what's interesting and what we should consider is that 90% of conventional management is basically here in the highlighted section. It influence, you know, stimulants will influence dopaminergic and epinephrine, norepinephrine activity. To a certain extent, it'll influence lobe development and striatal connectivity, but not a whole lot. And that basically means that there's a lot left on the table when it comes to what you can actually do for them from a functional perspective. I mean, literally 25% of what is treated 90% of the time is with medication, right? And it only treats 25% of what needs to be happening. So, and that's 90% of, of, of how people are treated. 75% of what a child needs is never delivered appropriately. That's what I'm trying to tell you here. And that's a very important thing to understand. And this leads us to a functional medicine approach in helping to manage ADD. So let's start by discussing diet. Then we're gonna discuss nutraceuticals, exercise, and cognitive function or exercises that are aimed at helping these people's brains. Now, this is a meta-analysis. It's a study that was demonstrated, uh, that, that demonstrated a diet high in refined sugars and saturated fat can increase the risk of ADD, whereas a healthy diet characterized by high consumption of fruits and vegetables and high nutrient density would actually protect against ADD. And here you can see all the studies showing a connection between unhealthy diet and ADD. And what's wild is that you literally still have doctors out there who will say things like, oh, diet doesn't matter. I mean, they simply don't know what they're talking about. Diet does matter. It actually matters in every single chronic health condition that you can think of. It matters in heart disease, Diet matters in diabetes, autoimmunity, and absolutely it matters for neurodevelopmental disorders. It's just that simple. But again, you can see here from this list, there's a number of studies and there's all these positive connections with unhealthy diet and the development of ADD. Now there's also the opposite on the other end of the spectrum. There's quite a bit of evidence that demonstrates that the opposite, a healthy diet actually decreases the risk of ADD. And then you have another systematic review and meta-analysis here on dietary influence of ADD. And here, what they found was that the pooled analysis established that healthy dietary patterns significantly decreased the risk of ADD 63% less odds. That's a huge number. Whereas a Western diet and junk food diet increased 92% and 51% respectively. So, you know, there's no doubt here, right? The diet impacts the brain and ADD. It is what it is. It's very important for you to make sure that your patients are starting there. Now, food, of course, is the best way to get micronutrients. We all know that. It's much better than supplementation. Some diets, however, are going to be better in terms of nutrient density, meaning that there's just certain foods that you're going to absorb more nutrients from 
from because your digestive tract absorbs those nutrients more efficiently from that particular food than other types of foods. And this is very important because you know we live in a time where people are eating a lot of food, they're getting a lot of calories, but we're at the same time micronutrient deficient. So we're overfed, but we're also at the same time malnourished. Now, this study looked at dietary profiles and nutritional status of kiddos with ADD, and they compared them to healthy controls. And what they found was that ADD children had significantly lower serum levels of several micronutrients, uh, such as vitamin B12, folate, vitamin B6, ferritin, monounsaturated fatty acids. And then they also found that they had higher levels of serum saturated fatty acids, abnormal fatty acid ratios, and inorganic phosphorus concentration. So once again, it's super important that we understand that micronutrient deficiency is part of what's happening here. And yes, you should be correcting it through diet, but if not, then supplementation is going to be the next best thing. Now, this paper basically says that unhealthy dietary patterns leads to poor micronutrient status affecting ADD behavior and the management of diet and nutrition should always be part of ADD treatment. Let's emphasize always. Diet is always going to be important when we're trying to address ADD. Okay, so food is medicine, but like I said earlier, food can also be our poison, especially when it comes to allergies and sensitivities. Now this particular study took children with ADD and they had them undergo a four week elimination diet of individual food sensitivities that were identified and then they reintroduced those foods. And what they found was that the symptoms returned once the reintroduction happened, suggesting that food sensitivities and allergies absolutely play a role. Now the most common sensitivities that were identified included things like milk, which of course you can see from here, it's off the charts corn off the charts, wheat off the charts as well. The same was true with cocoa and egg. And then you had other things, which is pretty interesting here, paprika, spices, plum, oats, etc. Again, studies show that when you eliminate these foods successfully, you're gonna see a resolution of symptoms. And this is why you'll commonly hear me telling my patients without even doing any kind of testing, if they have any neurodevelopment issues, I'm gonna suggest that they avoid corn, soy, gluten, and dairy. It's just a standard practice there. Now, the bottom line with diet is that, heck yeah, it matters. And we have to get them off to processed foods, high sugar diets, uh, we need to get them on nutritionally dense foods and assess for food sensitivities and allergies. Let's go ahead and talk about, about nutraceuticals. Now, one of the most powerful nutraceuticals is going to be omegas or fish oil. This was a meta-analysis which looked at omega-3 levels, and what they found was that omega-3 levels were actually reduced in children when uh, uh, in ADD when it was actually measured. Now. Uh, as you can read here, omega-3 levels are reduced in children with ADHD. There is sufficient evidence to consider omega-3 fatty acids as a possible supplement to establish therapies. Now, I don't know if you see this in your own practice or even if you're measuring this, but um, the omega check is something that you can get done at most national laboratories. Uh, almost everyone that I measure omegas for, they're always very, very low. Uh, the omega serum level should be somewhere between 8 and 16. And I find that for adults, on average, it's 4, and for children, it's actually 2. I also see a significantly high omega 6 to 3 ratio. Now, a omega 6 to 3 ratio should really be around 1 to 1. That would be ideal. But I see that the average is in the 20s, suggesting this high level of inflammation because of essential fatty acid imbalances. Compared to children without ADD, there's sufficient evidence to consider giving children uh, with ADD fish oil omega-3 fatty acids, and they go on to point that there's evidence that omega-3 supplementation improves clinical symptoms and cognitive performance in children with ADD. Now, vitamin D deficiency is another thing to be concerned about because it's strongly linked with ADD and inattention. And correcting vitamin D deficiency leads to improvements in cognitive function. I think it's also important to consider functional reasons for deficiencies of nutrients though. Um, in other words, there's intake, right? Are you eating enough of the food? Are you getting the foods that contain these nutrients? That's step number one. Step number two is, 
are you digesting, absorbing those nutrients? And this is assuming that you have proper levels of stomach acid and digestive enzymes, the gallbladder is working in the case of fat soluble vitamins. And then the third thing is, is there a physiological dysfunction that's using it all up, right? More than normal. So all kind of these, you know, different areas that you have to think about, not just, oh, this person's deficient. Let me, you know, slam them with a bunch of more nutrients. There could be other reasons why this is happening. So I'm just bringing this up is that we should always take a step back and try to think about what might be occurring here. So it may not be due to intake or absorption, but it could be due to some other reason. And specifically for vitamin vitamin D, it's connected to something like inflammation where the more inflamed somebody is, it's going to use up vitamin D, so therefore it can show up to be low. Just keep that in mind. Either way though, vitamin D is important and hyperactivity and impulsivity were both found to be cl clinically significant with vitamin D deficiency. And again, correcting those deficiencies were clinically meaningful. And as you can see here, again, this included hyperactivity and impulsivity before supplementation, after supplementation for both of those. Uh, and again, pretty significant numbers there, right, in terms of changing that. Now this was a randomized control trial on ginkgo biloba, which is known to increase blood flow to the brain. And it was demonstrated that ginkgo is an effective and safe therapy to also use in the treatment of ADD. Bicolin, or Chinese skullcap as you may know it, is a powerful botanical known to raise dopamine in the brain. And it does appear to influence the striatal structures as well, which is very important for ADD individuals. So again, here's just another compound that you can consider uh, for children that are struggling with ADD. Then we have things like probiotics. Bacteria have the capacity to generate many neurotransmitters and neuromodulators. It has been determined that lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, for example, produce GABA, bacillus and saccharomyces produce noradrenaline, and then you have things like candida and streptococcus and E. coli and enterococcus that help to produce serotonin. Now there are several dozens, if not hundreds of studies outlining the specific influence of probiotic strains, the bacteria, the colonies in your digestive tract, the microbiome, and neurotransmitter production or influence. This also includes hormones, by the way. We know that dopamine, noradrenaline, serotonin, GABA, acetylcholine, histamine, all of these compounds are going to be upregulated or downregulated based on the specific bacterial strains that are present within the digestive tract. Again, the microbiome has a very strong influence on everything that's happening here. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about one of the most important medicines, and that is going to be exercise. Now, now this study was published and it was a meta-analysis done on non-pharmaceutical interventions for ADD, ADHD. It was a systematic review and a meta-analysis, and they state, our final meta-analysis included 18 studies with interventions that were categorized into four categories. You had neurofeedback, you had cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive training, and then physical exercise, and all of which dramatically helped the frontal lobe in terms of improvements, but physical exercise demonstrated the, the highest average effect. Uh, and here you can see, you know, the table from this study, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy definitely had an effect size that was pretty decent. You can see it over here at the very top. And then the second one, you can see cognitive training, not as much. Then you have neurofeedback, which was a little bit more. And then of course you have physical exercise, which had a dramatic difference, right? It was a big difference. Uh, so these are things that again, anybody can do. And it's important to identify or, or to pull out uh, within this study, it was only 20 to 30 minutes of exercise. So it's not like these people were spending all, sing you know, all day at the gym. It was just a little bit of bicycle or a little bit of walking in place or a little bit of running. And that showed a, a pretty big improvement. Now, I say exercise is the best medicine, literally better than any pharmaceutical, better than any supplement, better than any herb or intervention that you can think of. It doesn't matter because the influence that exercise has is paramount when you look at all the physiological mechanisms that it has for us, including neurohormone production and regulation, peptide production, chemical signaling, antioxidant production, neurotransmitter status, natural opiates, and then of course you have psychological factors. So it's just a must for anyone really wanting to address neurodevelopment, behavior, and mood disorders. 
Now, the research included in this review showed that children with ADD, ADHD undertaking exercise imp uh, experienced improvements in their characteristic symptoms, mainly attention deficit and hyperactivity in comparison to other sedentary tasks, such as just watching a video. Now, five minutes, five minutes of jumping or 30 minutes on a treadmill uh, or static bicycle were enough to produce appreciable improvements in inhibitory control or in cognitive and executive functions. Benefits following exercise were also seen in other aspects, such as reaction time and preparation for response, motor skills, or brain activity. The findings indicated that exercise interventions improved overall executive functions of children and adolescents with ADD, and exercise interventions had a moderate to large positive effect on inhibitory control and cognitive flexibility. Preschool moderate to vigorous physical activity may also be a viable method of reducing ADD, ADHD levels and impairments for those with lower processing speeds. So all that said, exercise is an absolute must. And then you have cognitive exercises such as brain body based therapies to consider. Now, I think it may not be as beneficial because of a catch 22, you know, to undergo, let's say cognitive training, such as mindfulness or meditation training, you need to have some patience, right? So how, how's that going to work for little Timmy? Who's just bouncing off the walls. Cause he's got ADD. It's not going to be very good. Right. But if you can actually get him to participate, there is evidence that it helps. Uh, here's a study here. Mindfulness based cognitive therapy might be a valuable tool or treatment option alongside treatment as usual. So just along with regular treatment for adult ADHD aimed at alleviating symptoms. Again, this is in adults, but I guarantee you it can work in children if you're able to get them to participate. Now, basically what they did is they took, uh, they took individuals and they asked them to perform mindfulness based cognitive therapy plus normal treatment, treatment as usual. And then they compared that to a group where they just did conventional treatment. And as you can see here from, from the graphs uh, provided, the black line is basically you know a reduction of symptoms. So you can see MBCT, which is mindfulness-based training, along with usual treatment outperformed in every single one, just conventional treatment. So all that said, after reviewing this info, how can we put all this together in order to help our patients? Well, personally, I don't treat ADD or ADHD. I simply identify imbalances in physiology, diet, and nutrition, and I correct those dysfunctions to support whatever conditions my patient is experiencing. And as we've discussed, diet, nutraceuticals, physical exercise, cognitive exercises, and then there, there's social interaction, which are all ways that you can do this. Now, personally, I start with diet. Many times dietary intervention is enough to see dramatic changes. I also don't like to overload my patients. So I try to walk them through the various stages and I literally just go from left to right here. I start with diet and I move all the way down the list to social interactions. Now for dietary intervention, I suggest paleo or a paleo Mediterranean diet because it basically eliminates the majority of the foods that we know that cause problems for ADD, corn, soy, gluten, dairy, fast food, dyes, things like that. And I ask that they follow paleo for at least eight to 12 weeks. And then also during this time, we're going to heavily support their microbiome diversity. And as far as microbiome diversity goes, I love the total gut restoration system from microbiome labs because it literally has all the foundations of what we need to rebuild a gut. The TGR system has Megaspore Biotic, which is known and proven to recondition the gut and contains key species known to influence or modulate neurotransmitter production. It has Mega Pre, which is a functional fiber-based food known to influence gut metabolites and short-chain fatty acid production. It also helps to regulate metabolism and immune function. And then we have Mega Mucosa, which is a rebuilder of sorts. And it also has compounds that can mop up and, uh, you know, talk toxicity or toxins or harmful metabolites within the gut. Also, uh, we know that this system using an in vitro model, there's studies where they show that fecal samples were used in vitro to evaluate the effects on the gut microbiome using the total gut restoration system. And what they found is that it resulted in short chain fatty acid production. And it also supported intestinal barrier function, basically reversing leaky gut, as well as modulating the immune system, which is pretty fascinating. 
Microbiome Labs also offers BiomeFX, which is a comprehensive stool-based assessment that allows you to identify keystone species that are important for neurotransmitter production. It also helps you to identify whether there's infections, pathogens, and then measure metabolites that are important for function. This is a great way to objectively track changes from start to finish with your recommendations, right? So you could do a test, see where they are, make your recommendations, and then do a post-test afterwards if you would like. Moving on to nutraceuticals, I start with diet and gut supports right off the bat. And if you do a lab workup as well and identify deficiencies, you know, you have things like omegas and vitamin D and B vitamins. Of course, you want to support them with all that. And then we have compounds that can influence dopamine, norepinephrine, cerebral blood flow, the microbiome, etc. So here's a few options, right? If we're talking about, uh, this is a slide that really just is based on the current literature of what appears to be the most impactful. Remember, you want to try to be targeted. You, want to, you don't want to send your patients off with 20, 20 different supplements. Uh, but these are all viable options to support different parts of the body, different systems, uh, if we're talking about nutraceutical management. Now, I highlighted or bolded those products that I like from Microbiome Labs, such as Bacillus subtilis, uh, Megaspore. They both have HU58. Uh, you've got uh, Mega Pre, the Total Gut Restoration System, Mega Marine, and you also have Mega Quinone, uh, which uh, pro provides vitamin D3 and K2. I also like Mega IgG, which again helps to mock, mop up toxins that might be within the body. And then, of course, you can see a list here of dopamine supports, norepinephrine supports, cerebral blood flow supports, uh, and on and on. Depending on compliance, if I feel that we can add extra intervention, in other words, if I know that they are built a habit of following the diet and they're executing that, you know, the way that I'd like them to and they're doing good with their supplements, then the next step I'm going to ask them to do is incorporate some exercise. And examples of physical exercise that I like to prescribe would include things like 10 to 20 minutes of running, biking or swimming. Uh, remember that this can be in place, in home or outside and always, always have them focus on progress over perfection. So, you know, five minutes is better than zero minutes, 10 minutes better than five, 20 minutes better than 10, you know, that type of thing. Other examples are getting them to move or exercise uh, would include gymnastics, you know, have them sign up with a gymnastics class, martial arts, yoga. Uh, kids, they love juggling, dribbling, jump roping, or playing catch even. And then there's things that you can even prescribe for a specific amount of time. Let's say I want you doing, you know, jump rope for five minutes, three times a week, right? So be very specific because that helps them to actually take some, some action steps. Examples of cognitive exercises, and again, this can be tough with children, mindfulness or meditation-based training. Um, some examples of this for a child, I would include things like playing with putty and trying to mold it into something because they have to concentrate, or cutting with scissors, like having them get a coloring book and turning the pages out and color, you know, cutting out the character because they have to focus on that. Uh, drawing or tracing and coloring. There's also focused activities like archery, which is great. Uh, anything that acts as a target practice. Uh, another good thing is stop go games such as red light, green light, you know, that type of stuff, right? Or interactive games like Twister or even Just Dance, which is fun for kids. Last but not least, I think it's important to promote social interaction. Interactive sports, you know, get them involved with team sports, social groups, whether that's at school, event participation or family events. As a society, we've become virtually connected and this has led to less direct physical connection. And we're social beings, right? And being social is medicine. And I know kids can be shy and I know they're gonna fight you on this, but it's very important to push ourselves out of our comfort zones because this helps us to grow, including growth for our brain. It's just such an important part of who we are because that's how we grow. So again, please consider uh, trying to promote social interactions with these individuals as well. And this brings us to the end of today's talk. Now, I hope that you've found this information valuable. I hope that you have some specific takeaways and most importantly, I hope that you take this information and you actually execute on it and you go home back to your clinic and you help as many kiddos as possible because the world knows that they need as much help as they can get. Thank you for your time. I really do hope that you enjoyed this talk.